Well, isn't that an interesting picture? Maybe you've been asked about this. Um, what about those natives in the deepest part of Africa? Are they somehow held accountable to God's righteousness? Because they've never heard. So we're going to be looking at that this morning. What about people who have never heard? Never heard of the gospel, never heard of Jesus. We are looking at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. It is interesting that Paul immediately makes one of the most um, joyous points that he is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the very power of God demonstrated for salvation to everyone, not only to the Jewish person to whom this, these promises were made, but also to Gentiles. For in this very act of Jesus on the cross, the righteousness of God was demonstrated for all. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We don't have to do anything. Now you would think from that point, Paul would continue to go forward with this idea of, of God's mercy and compassion and how this is the free gift of salvation. And yet we pick up in verse 18, he is going to pose the exact opposite. He's going to prove, he's going to establish his point about God's righteousness by going with the negative. What if you don't have God's righteousness? What if you don't have your sins paid for by Jesus? Picking up at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. Because what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. He has revealed it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks In their, uh, but they can, became futile in their thoughts and in their senseless hearts were darkened. They were, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the image of resembling human beings or birds or four-footed animals. Well, we are looking with this and your translations may have some different words there. Um, these are some very difficult verses just to go straight from Paul's pen to say exactly, clearly, without, I, I'm, but the meaning is still going to be the same. Now, looking at this idea of salvation and where we are at and why Paul wants to, to proclaim this gospel, we look at some of the statements that have been made by the Southern Baptist and the London Confession. We note the London Confession of 1689 as the Reformation was firmly taking place. Um, why is it that I need to preach the gospel? Why is it that I need Jesus? And the London Confession says the distance between God and the creature, mankind, is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience to him as their creator, that would be the reasonable thing to do as we look around and see the complexity of nature. Yet they could never have attained the reward of life but by some of a voluntary uh, condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of the death of Jesus. In other words, there is so much distance between a righteous God and our fallen nature, even though we could clearly see it's been made evident since the creation of the world who God is and what we should be doing. We deny all that. Now, the Baptist faith and message is not quite as clear, but uh, through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherited nature and an environment inclined towards sin. Now, if we put that right next to God's righteousness, there's our problem. 
Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. We should know what we do to do, but we don't. Well, um, how do we go forward with this? You know, looking from last week, um, this idea of the anger of God, uh, this is a very necessary idea. Um, hard to understand the mercy, the compassion of the Almighty and the sacrifice of Jesus if I don't have, at the same time, uh, an idea of why that was necessary. Um, this is one of the crucial false teachings of our day. So many churches are preaching the idea that, well, you come to church so that God will bless you. He, he just is waiting for you to come to church, and then he can bless you more. And, well, if you don't come to church, then he can't bless you as much as he wants to. Well, from these verses in Romans, Paul would say, where did you get that idea? You're, you're coming to church, as we saw a few weeks ago, because you need to be rescued from your sin. And by coming to church, you are using the very gifts that God has given you to strengthen others, to encourage others that they might reflect Jesus more in their life and give glory to God. And so the question that we had from last week, well, what about this anger? Is God really angry? And we were able to see last week, well, just this idea that as human beings, we look around and we deny the very character, the position, the essence of God. We deny that. And then we commit acts that we know are wrong. Now, this is not limited to the Old Testament. Um, Jan was sharing with me this morning, she just finished the Old Testament. I, I don't think her viewpoint, having finished Malachi, is, whew, I'm so glad to get rid of that angry God and get on to the New Testament. <laughs> there are many parts, if not most of the Old Testament, is full of promise and hope. But this is not what many of the current personalities may preach. We, we have some of the uh, false teaching from Andy Stanley and, and others that you don't need the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament is an angry God that we want to avoid. This is not the truth. This is a lie from the pit of hell because Paul is stating this as a fact. God is angry with everyone for very understandable very just reasons. He's angry with all of mankind because we continue, even now, to deny his existence, to deny his sovereignty, his control. And then we do things that we know are wrong. We are willfully disobedient, still. And this matches scripture from Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation. This is not an ending attitude towards uh, mankind by God in the Old Testament, even though um, many would say, well, God is angry in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, Jesus is loving. Somehow in the Old Testament, God is just wanting to smite people, but in the New Testament, we have Jesus walking around, petting a lamb, just hoping you'll be his friend. Paul is being very clear here. That's not the truth. We are in a very uh, precarious position here. We have a real problem because we continue to deny God for who he is. We deny his position, his authority, his power, his holiness, his sovereignty in order that we might make willful acts of disobedience attempting to pursue our own pleasures. God is rightfully angry because we disbelieve in who he is. And so we might say all sin really begins with a disbelief in who God is. If, if you might think about your favorite sin, you, you couldn't do that, or at least that sin that you habitually commit. You, you really couldn't do that if you really believe God is going to hold me accountable for this, and I know it's wrong, and I'm certain of this, I can't do this anymore. 
Well, Paul is going to advance this argument now. We're going to look at verse um, 19. Why is God so angry? And last week we were thinking about um, God is rightfully angry with us because we deny him for who he really is. And we willfully disobey and we willfully transgress what we know is true. Now, Paul is going to take it a little bit further. Verse 19. God has made his nature known to everyone. For the wrath of God is revealed to everyone because what can be known about God has been plainly exhibited. What really can be known about God is made visible to everyone. And we think about the seasons. We think about his general providence for all of us. We think about the rains coming, as Solomon said. It's, it rains every, every season, and yet the water runs to the sea, but the sea is not full. We, we think of just the complexity of the human body. And the big word that seems to be growing now in, in the scientific journals is irre, irreducible complexity. Evolution can't possibly be the answer because these things are just so complex at the very basic levels, you couldn't get there from blind evolution. And as we look around, even at the trees outside and the clouds and the rain and the seasons, Paul is saying, What we ought to be doing is saying, this didn't come by accident. This didn't come by evolution. This comes from the hand of God who's being compassionate with us, providing for us. And yet, we're going to deny that God exists. What can be known, what is knowable about God has been made evident. Because God has made it plain. It isn't hidden. It isn't just for those who know the magic words. It isn't just for those who manage to find their way out of all the streets and series to come through these doors. Paul is making it very plain. What is knowable about God? There is a basic amount of knowable ideas about God's position, his sovereignty, his power, his creation. That's available to everyone. Everyone has seen that. It has been revealed since the creation of the world. And our response needs to be, this didn't come by our abilities. This didn't come by evolution. Now, God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made This is um, some complex ideas. What Paul is saying is, just by looking around us from creation, by what we can see, and in, I'm sure our translations are going to vary a little bit here, by what is visible to us, we should be able to come up with some ideas, some accurate ideas about what is not visible, about the attributes, the nature, the sovereignty, the power of the Almighty. By what we can see, there is a valid consequence, a conclusion. It leads directly to being able to say, because of what I can see, I reasonably know what God must be like. He must be all-powerful. He must be sovereign. He must be the one who created all of this. Because of what we can see, because of what we can know, because of what we can touch and feel, we are without excuse because those things lead invariably, undeniably, to having to admit this is what God is about. This is who he must be. Now there is some, there was a lot of ink on this part. I'm not so sure it makes a big deal of difference, but there was a lot of ink I read in my commentaries. Whether the idea is he has made it plain to them or he has made it plain within them. I'm not sure that makes a lot of difference. 
Paul is saying what you need to know about God is plainly evident to you. Now, whether that's visible from the outside or as C.S. Lewis might say, it's been placed within you, you're still in the same place. C.S. Lewis thought one of the real foundational proofs for the existence of God in mere Christianity was we have this idea of how people should treat us. We have an idea that people should be honest with us. People shouldn't try to harm us. They should be good with us. His point is, where would you get that idea if this is just blind evolution? And Paul would say, those ideas come from God placing his nature, his ideas in you. That's what you look upon the world around you and you would say, how did I get this way? This is what God has done. This is what God has created. If we have been created this way, there is a sovereign God in control of all things. What we can see leads invariably to what we can't see. And this has been true since creation. Adam and Eve in the garden could look around at the expanse of what God has created and there was no other possible conclusion for them to come up with other than this is the glory, the power, the creativity of the God we worship. Now Paul would say this is true of the most remote people on earth. It's also true of those who are in the middle of the city. Now, as we were looking at that introductory slide at the very beginning this morning, we have the idea, we have the idea that the more primitive people are, the more innocent they are. We have the idea that, you know, these poor people in the very hearts of the jungle, um, well, they don't know God. So how can they be held accountable? And the Apostle Paul would say, who are these people of whom you speak that haven't seen the existence, the power, the sovereignty of God? It's all around them. It's all around them from those people that are living in the most remote part of the jungle to those people that are living in the middle of the city. And I dare say there are more people living in the middle of our cities who are just as suppressive of the truth and who don't want to hear the truth and who are unreached by the gospel than there are possibly remote people living in distant places. These are undeniable facts, Paul says in verse 20. These are undeniable facts. God has revealed his nature since the beginning of time. That nature is consistent. It doesn't change. You can't possibly have an angry God of the Old Testament, but a loving God in the New Testament. God doesn't change. And so these are undeniable facts. What is true in the Garden of Eden needs to be true in series. We look around at the trees and the clouds and the rain, and we say, this didn't come here by itself. This, this is not here by blind evolution. This speaks of the sovereignty of our God. This speaks of his power. And if this is the way he is with what I can see, there are some very obvious conclusions I can come to about what I can't see. What I can't see about his nature. What I can't see about his authority. What I can't see about his righteousness and justice. Those are evident because of what I can see, the miraculous structure of the human eye. This comes back to that idea of irreducible complexities. There gets to be a part where evolution can't possibly explain this. The natural mind comes to these points and it's a dead end. You, you have to be able to look at the world around you and say, this is God. And because of what I can see, because I can see he's merciful. He sends the rain. We are in that Goldilocks zone around the sun where it's not too hot and it's not too cold and we get consistent weather and we can grow crops and we can come up with our own food. And all of this comes from the hand of the Almighty and we should be able to say, because of what I can see, 
I can make some reliable conclusions about God that I can't see. Because what can be known about God in its most basic forms is completely evident. Now this is called natural theology. This, this is what's available to all mankind. This is not everything, of course. You, you can't go out and examine trees and come up with a way to be saved. You, you have to have Jesus for that. And so we have natural theology. And from Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, we have revealed theology. We have that theology that comes from special revelation. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, out of all the revelation God has made through all of the prophets, through all of the holy men of old, it all culminates in Jesus. There is nothing else to be said. He is the final revelation from God. Well, the revelation that Jesus came and lived among us is, of course, much clearer than looking at all the different flowers and trees. And so that's true. Natural theology would say, I know there's a God. Natural theology is not going to lead you to heaven. You, you can't be saved by looking at flowers. And yet, I would be able to say natural theology tells me there has to be something else. Because of what I see, I can make some reliable, obvious conclusions about what I can't see. As such, Paul says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, and this is where your translations are going to all be different, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So everyone is without excuse. Everyone is without excuse. The most remote person, the most isolated person has no excuse. The most engaged city dweller living in the heart of Modesto has no excuse. In fact, has more demand for justice. We, we can turn on our computers and hear sermons. We can go buy Bibles. We are more under God's judgment. In order to avoid this, both for the person in the jungle and the person in the heart of Modesto, you have to suppress what you know is true. That's the only way you can sin. That's the only way you can reject this. That's the only way you can try to possibly stand and say, well, I didn't know any of this. Well, you're trying to tell me you didn't know any of this because you are denying all of it. You're suppressing what is obvious. Now, this also kind of works for us. As we go through a difficult day, we can look around us and say, I can conclude some things about my heavenly father by what I can see. By what I can see and conclude in his mercy and compassion and sovereignty, my faith can be strengthened. I know that he cares. I know that he's sovereign. I know that he's in control just by the nature that I see. In order to deny this, you are suppressing the truth that you know is true. It's obvious, and you know that it's true, but you're trying to tell me you don't believe it. That's the only way you can continue with this. Whether you are in the jungle, which is easier for us to believe you're lost, or whether you're in the heart of the city. And so again, Paul would say, who are these people who have not heard that you speak of? There are none. Everyone has this knowledge of God available to them. They can look around and see and be able to touch and feel and say there, there's something greater than nature here. Well, our conclusions this morning have to be kind of obvious. Following Jesus avoids God's wrath. We are under God's wrath for many reasons. Number one, we deny him for who he really is. We saw that last week. And we continue to rebel against him. This week, we would say you are under God's wrath because what is evident around you points to God. 
and you continue to suppress it. What is evident around you should give you faith when you have challenges. What is evident around you that you can see and touch should encourage you when you come to the Lord with a prayer about a health concern. I know that he cares for the birds. I know that he cares for the seeds and the trees and the water cycle. Well, obviously, he's in control of all things. The unmistakable truth also this morning is on our own. We cannot avoid God's wrath. On our own, consistent pattern, we're going to suppress the truth. On our own, we're going to try to come up with whatever crazy idea about why the stars are in the sky, or why there's a water cycle, or why there's the complexity of the human eye, and, and unsaved, unregenerate people come up with ideas about evolution and whatever else. That's suppressing the truth. On your own, you're going to you're going to be under God's wrath. Now that is also a foundation for what we think we need to do here. A foundation of our ministry needs to be, I know all of these people around us are under God's wrath. It's unavoidable. It's the nature that they can see around them. They have no excuse. His nature is visible to all of us. You don't have to come into this church to know that God exists. That should help. We should be preaching that God exists. It should be clear from what you hear in a church. But even if you don't go to church, everyone in this city, everyone in the world is without excuse. You can see it in the nature around you. And so one of our final points this morning, because you cannot deny nature, because you can see the patterns all around you. And because of what you can see, you're encouraged with what you can't see. Once again, we say we come to church to encourage each other not to suppress the truth. We come to church to encourage each other not to suppress what we know is true. Not to get fooled by science. Not to get fooled by medicine. Are we responsible? Yes, but I know God is in ultimate control of everything. I can see that in the nature around me. Now, Paul is going to continue to go on all the way through chapter 3. Who doesn't have an excuse? Who is guilty of God's wrath? Now, he's starting out, we've seen this morning, with the most remote person. Everybody is under God's wrath from last week because you deny God for who he is. And you continue to violate what you know is true. And this morning, God is angry with us because we deny his very existence, even though it's evident in the world around us. We deny that, even though it's plain. We can't deny it, but we do. And it's been there all along. And so we are without excuse. Now, we're going to continue to go forward as Paul talks about there is no excuse for anyone, not the Jews, not the Gentiles, not the most report. Yes, I know it's not very encouraging. I know that it's not a very uplifting idea, except, yes, we can avoid God's wrath. We can avoid God's wrath. You are without excuse as you come here this morning. You will be held accountable, but Jesus has paid that price. You don't have to have that wrath. From looking around at nature, the clouds, the rain we've had, the change in the weather, the seasons, we should be able to all say, I know there has to be a sovereign God who created this. And I've been violating all of his, his laws and his, I've been denying his nature, but I don't have to suffer the wrath of God. Jesus took care of that. Can we encourage each other with that this morning? Accept the truth. Be stronger. Look around you this morning at the trees, the sky, the sun, and be able to say, from what I can see, I know God is in control. And I want to accept that truth that he's in control of everything. And if he's in control of everything, I'm going to come to his throne through the blood of Jesus and have his forgiveness. I don't have to be under his wrath. Isn't that great news? 
Let us pray. Our Father, this is perhaps difficult to believe that nobody can be excused from your judgment. And at the same time, to be able to admit that we have such an extravagance of resources and availability of the truth in our culture, in our country, that it's, it's unavoidable that we will be held accountable for what we know, what we should have known, the resources we should have used, how much time we spend avoiding your truth. How thankful we are that you have solved this problem by Jesus on the cross. On our own, we could not avoid your, your wrath and judgment. But we are going to claim the, the blood of Jesus to avoid this wrath. We pray that we would continue, perhaps begin, but we will want to encourage one another. We will want to encourage each other to accept the truth, to be stronger in our faith. You are in control of all things. You have created all things and you have provided for our salvation. Let us be joyful and strong in that. We pray these things for your honor and glory. In the name of the risen one, amen.